Okay, so hello and welcome back. So today we're taking a look at the very final and end <laughs> of the Napoleonic Wars playlist for all of the battles. Um, obviously, it's going to be the Battle of Waterloo 1815. Most people have heard that in passing. So without further ado, uh, please if you like, like the video. Uh, it really does help. Thank you to my Patreons. Also, uh, I will be pausing, so if you don't like that, I suggest check the original video. Last thing, as I mentioned in the previous video, I am going to try to get the 1870 Waterloo and we can watch it together as a reaction. Hopefully that's going through. If that is the case, the time card will pop up now. You can go watch that. Um, and at the very end of the video, I will try to link it there. Um, it'll be a day after this video comes out, but you know, there you go. Uh, so if it's a day after <laughs> uh, and the video is available, if everything went according to plan, then it should be there and we can watch it together. Otherwise, let's finish this series off with a banger. April 1814. For 10 years, one man has dominated Europe. Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French. Under his military genius, France conquered an empire that spanned the continent. But finally, he has been defeated by a grand coalition of his enemies. Napoleon is forced to abdicate and exiled to the tiny island of Elba. While the Bourbon monarchy is restored to France in the corpulent form of Louis XVIII. Also on Elba with him, or some of, he could have a personal guard of 400 soldiers. He actually took a lot of Polish soldiers with him because they were extremely loyal to him and would die for him along with, you know, some of his old guard. And Louis the 18th. Oh boy, Louis the 18th. <laughs> yeah, he's not a very good monarch. But rumors soon reached Napoleon that France would welcome his return. The French people have little love for the monarchy or its hangers on. The very people whose excesses led to the French Revolution 25 years before. He also learns that at the Congress of Vienna, his enemies are locked in bitter dispute over the future of Europe. Napoleon decides to act. After just 10 months in exile, he returns to France, where the troops sent to arrest him rally to his cause instead. Most of France soon follows suit. But in Vienna, the coalition immediately put their differences to one side. They declare Napoleon an outlaw and mobilize their forces for war. Napoleon knows he must act boldly. And uh, in the movie, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> they have declared war against me, not France, me. They have declared Napoleon an outlaw, and they are specifically targeting him to remove him. They're not targeting France, they're targeting him. Before the coalition launches a coordinated invasion of France, just one last thing about that. How badass do you have to be to have major powers declare war on you as a person? Not, Fr not, <laughs> not France, you. He counts on winning a quick victory and then negotiating peace from a position of strength. He targets the coalition armies within easiest reach. Prince Blücher's Prussian army and the Duke of Wellington's Anglo-Allied army, both camped in Belgium. Napoleon's force is a match for either coalition army on its own, but he'll be heavily outnumbered if they're able to join forces. So he must keep them apart and defeat each in turn. So again, it's his defeat in detail strategy. Napoleon's army crosses the frontier near Charleroi, intending to drive a wedge between the two coalition armies. That makes sense. If you look at the roads, it's very, you had to take Brussels. If you could take Brussels, you can really split them in half, or even take some of these MSR roads so they can't link up. Um, now, what's not mentioned here is, yes, he was able to raise an army extremely quickly of 93,000 people. A lot of conscripts, a lot of some of his, some of his old veterans. 
a lot of his marshals didn't actually join him. Some did, some didn't. Berthier did not. Berthier was the chief of staff for Napoleon. Basically, he was his second. He did all of the staff work for everything Napoleon did, and he did not join him. This is going to throw allied the French orders into absolute chaos, because Berthier had been there since basically day one. The next day, Napoleon sends his left wing under Marshal Ney to take the crossroads at Quatre Bras. There, Ney clashes with Wellington's army, still scrambling into position. The Allied troops fight off a series of French attacks and just manage to hold their ground. The same day, Napoleon attacks Blücher's Prussian army with his main force near the village of Ligny. The battle is a brutal slugging match, but the French emerge triumphant. The 72-year-old Blücher leads a cavalry charge in person and has his horse killed under him. He only just escapes capture. The Prussian... 72 years old and leading a cavalry charge. No, no man is like Blücher. He's a, he's a blue-blooded Prussian. ...army retreats, but it is not broken. Napoleon sends his right wing under Marshal Grouchy to keep them on the run and turns his own attention to Wellington's army. The British general doesn't receive news. This is technically mistake number one with Marshal Grouchy. There were better marshals um, to do this. But long story short, Napoleon doesn't like Marshal's independent command and Grouchy knew that and he didn't attack Blücher as much. ...of Blücher's defeat until the next morning at which point he orders a retreat through heavy summer showers to a position eight miles south of Brussels, near the village of Waterloo. There he receives a promise from Blücher that the Prussians will march to his aid the next morning. So Wellington decides to stand and fight. Wellington has chosen his battlefield with care. His troops are behind a gentle ridge, which will give them some shelter from French cannon fire. His right flank is anchored on the farmhouse of Hougoumont, his center on the farm of La Haye Sainte, and his left on the farm of Papillotte. All three are fortified and garrisoned with elite troops. And he's on his uh, hill. This is also the very first time, and the only time, Napoleon and Wellington will actually face each other. Wellington has been in the game for a very long time, since around 1804, 1805, 1806, all the way through Spain. Um, and this is the first time he's going to face Napoleon. Now, he's heard a lot about Napoleon, but he's never actually faced him. But being the studious man that he was, he you know is going to be, prepare a defensive position. He's choosing the battlefield, which is Waterloo here, and he's building his... Uh, defenses basically he's planned he wants napoleon to attack him because this is the ground of his choosing and his anchor points at Le Saint, probably farm and hugo mall um are garrisoned by elite troops again they need to hold they basically are going to stall napoleon from launching a full frontal assault on wellington because they need to take these three points to initiate a full frontal assault wellington's men need every advantage they can get the opposing armies are roughly equal in size but his is a ragtag mix of British, Dutch, and German troops. Men so the actual amount of British troops there is 31,000. British love to use other people to fight. Um, so the Kingdom of the Netherlands, you know, the country that's actually being attacked, has 17,000 men in the field. The Kingdom of Hanover has 11,000. Duchy of Brunswick, 6,000. Duchy of Nassau, 3,000. These guys speak English. These guys speak Dutch. These guys speak some form of German that... These guys probably don't speak. These guys probably speak some form of German that they don't speak. And these guys also speak some form of German that all these guys don't speak. German is very heavily dependent on where you are from, even today. Uh, an example is my German professor told me a story. He's like, I went to Berlin, and he, he, he knows German, and he was taking a piss in a urinal, and some dude comes up to him and starts talking to him in German. And my professor thought the man was having a stroke because of his German accent, his Berlin accent. He thought he was having a stroke because that's how unintelligible it was. So when I say these people really had a communication problem, yeah, these Germans are going to have a communication problem just speaking to each other, let alone anyone else. You got, you got, really you have five languages that are being spoken. Many of whom have never seen combat before. 
They will have to hold off Napoleon's army of veterans until Prussian reinforcements arrive, or the battle, and probably the war, will be lost. Sunday dawns bright and fair. Napoleon has ordered Marshal Grouchy to pursue the Prussians and keep them busy, while he defeats Wellington's army at Waterloo and opens the road to Brussels. But it's Grouchy who gets pinned down, fighting the Prussian rearguard at Wavre. The main Prussian force eludes him and is already marching to Wellington's aid. At Waterloo, Napoleon delays his attack, waiting for the ground to dry, which will make movement easier for his troops. But the lost hours will later prove costly. The battle begins around 11 a.m. Now, people have wargamed out this scenario. I will just tell you this right now. People have wargamed out this scenario, and Napoleon, more than not, usually wins here. He doesn't win the war at all. Any. Going past this, Napoleon is still going to lose. He's also still going to die in 1821 from stomach cancer. And that's actually going to play a part in this battle of him being unwell. Um, but, yeah, wargaming it out is a little different from, you know, being there. But all I will say is this. Napoleon knew that he had to attack fast because Prussians were coming either way. Now, he relied on Grouchy to do his job which is one un Napoleonic un Napoleon at all. I mean, he barely ever does that. And second, um, he's going to wait until 11 for the ground to dry for the guns. Now that makes sense because the ground was really boggy down here um, and you can't move your guns and fire. So it's difficult to say that if he would launch his attack at eight, he would have, I mean, that's three hours that, that definitely could have made a significant difference in this battle, but he wouldn't have had artillery support. When Napoleon orders a feint against Wellington's right flank at Hougoumont, he hopes Wellington will commit his reserves here, drawing them away from the center where the main blow will fall. But Hougoumont's British and German defenders cling on desperately throughout the day. At one point, the French force their way through the main gate, but it's shut behind them, and the intruders are all killed. Wellington later calls it the decisive moment of the battle. Around noon, 80 French cannon open fire against the main Allied line. Most of Wellington's men are out of sight on the reverse slope, but many cannonballs still find their mark, smashing bloody holes in the Allied ranks. At 1.30 p.m., Napoleon sends in his infantry. Let me go look at a reverse slope and show you what I mean by that. Okay, very quickly, a reverse slope. So if basically this is the crest, so this is where quote unquote um, uh, Wellington's forces are. A reverse slope is here. So that means his forces are down here. If the French are firing, you know, this way, they're going to be hitting this forward slope on the military crest. Okay, um, whereas got no uh, Wellington's guys are on a reverse slope, so it gives him some coverage. So that's that. Back to the video. The French columns are met by disciplined musket fire and then charged by British heavy cavalry. The French attack disintegrates as Napoleon's men try to save themselves from the crushing hooves and flashing sabres. Scores of Frenchmen are ridden down and two of their famous eagle standards are captured. But the British cavalry, exhilarated by success, charge too far. They become scattered, their horses blown. At their most vulnerable, they're countercharged by French cavalry and suffer terrible losses. Among the dead, Major General Sir William Ponsonby, commander of the Union Brigade. As the, in the movie they say, those are some of the bravest men I've seen. They're some of the bravest men, uh, some of the best cavalrymen in Europe, but also the worst led. Um, I think they're house guard. Uh, Ray, I'll look that up. I'll get back to you on that. It was actually a bit hard to find, uh, but they're the Royal Scots Greys. 
uh, Royal Regiment of Scots Dragoons, Royal Northern British Dragoons, Royal Scots Grades, basically. Um, and yeah, the photo of them charging at Waterloo. Um, yeah, they, again, are very good cavalrymen, and they get slaughtered, um, as was said in the video. So there you go. Back to the video. Around 4 p.m., Marshal Ney thinks he sees the Allies begin to retreat and leads a mass cavalry charge to drive home the advantage. But Ney is wrong. The Allied infantry are ready, formed in hollow squares with bayonets fixed. The French cavalry can't break into these impregnable formations. They can only circle impotently until they retreat or are shot from the saddle. Ney's failure to support this attack with either infantry or artillery is a serious blunder. Napoleon was not well at this time, so he couldn't call this off. And that is true. You need to send infantry forward cavalry because they either do two things. They either sit in their squares and die from infantry fire or they go into line formation and your cavalry can actually do something. Or your artillery, you know, pound the ever-living crap out of them if they're in a square like this. But again, he didn't coordinate. Meanwhile, Blücher's Prussians have begun to arrive. They capture the village of Plancenoit, threatening Napoleon's flank and forcing him to send reserves to recapture it. Around 6 p.m., French infantry finally capture the farmhouse of La Haye Sainte in the center of the battlefield. It allows the French to bring forward artillery and blast the Allied squares from close range. They can't miss the closely packed formations, and casualties quickly mount. And that's why the high salt was uh, so vital, is if you take this position, you can bring up your artillery and start blasting, which is exactly what they did. Although it is 6 p.m. It begins to seem that if Wellington's army doesn't retreat, it will be killed where it stands. But the situation for Napoleon is also desperate. The Prussians are arriving in force, and he's running out of men to throw against Wellington's army. So he turns to his ultimate reserve, the elite Imperial Guard, the most feared troops in Europe. At 7.30 p.m., 3,000 of these battle-hardened veterans march past their emperor and across the corpse-strewn battlefield. I could be wrong, um, but in the movie, they do show him at least wanting to go with the guard. <laughs> and that makes sense. I mean, this, this is everything he's got. He'd rather die there than on some island, right? Towards the Allied center. Wellington's redcoats rise to meet them and pour devastating volleys of musket fire into their ranks. When the Allies fix bayonets and prepare to charge, the Imperial Guard wavers and then retreats. Wellington, sensing victory, orders a general advance. About the same time, the Prussians recapture Plans Noir. News of the Imperial Guard's defeat and rumors of encirclement by the Prussians sweep through the French ranks. Panic breaks out, and the French army flees the battlefield. Only Napoleon's old guard maintain their discipline, mounting a heroic but doomed rearguard action. Think about that. They're the only unit to mount any sort of defense, um, and they had been beaten back. That shows you the strength and the camaraderie ship of the old guard. Napoleon himself is forced to abandon his carriage and barely escapes the pursuing Prussian cavalry. The battle is won. The Duke of Wellington and Prince Blücher meet and congratulate each other outside Napoleon's former headquarters, an inn called La Belle Alliance. Blücher thinks it's the perfect name for their shared victory but Wellington prefers the more English-sounding Waterloo, where he has his own headquarters. Ever the aristocrat and gentleman that he is of, how do I say this politely? Everyone else can uh, 
bend off. I'll say that. Uh, that's not English, gentlemen. The Battle of Waterloo was, in the words of the Duke of Wellington, a damned near-run thing. It was also one of the bloodiest battles of the age. Around 50,000 men were killed or wounded, 23,000 coalition casualties, 27,000 French. Due to an appalling shortage of medical care, many of the wounded were left lying on the battlefield for several days. I'm gonna say that 50,000 casualties is a lot, especially for a battle of that size. And it, well, when you leave people like that, the casualty count gets, you know, a lot higher when you don't have, you know, medical anything. Napoleon was utterly defeated. Unable to raise another army, he surrendered to the British. They transported him to a second exile on the tiny remote Atlantic island of St. Helena. This time there was no escape. He died there six years later. And from what we speculate, he died from stomach cancer. It's basically almost known at this point. Um, and yeah, so even if we go on to like an alternate history path kind of thing, he would still die in 1821. I mean, cancer doesn't just you know, go away. Um, and even if then if he took the throne back, let's just say hypothetically in 1815, he dies six years later and his son is like 10. So it's not, he's not like going to be able to rule. Waterloo marked the beginning of a period of relative peace in Europe. There were no wars between the great powers for 40 years, and the British would not fight on the continent for another 100 years, until the summer of 1914. Forty years after the battle, a pioneer in the new art of photography captured these remarkable images. Let's go through these, actually. Yeah, so the, we actually do have, these are, these are veterans of Waterloo, and we have pictures of them. This man is an old guard, and he's a corporal with one stripe. Uh, this is a hussar of some description. I am not entirely sure. Um, I can't tell you. That could be Prussian, that could be British, that could be French. They're veterans of Napoleon's armies, by then all old men in their 70s and 80s. This guy... Okay, let's bring it back. Oops. This guy looks... French. This design, usually with a crest, if you look at a Russian um, honor guard today, they have a very similar design, but again, I can't tell the color, but he looks French, he looks a corporal. I could be wrong there, but the helmet and everything look correct. It is. Among okay, so this is an eagle, so I'm assuming a hussar. Again, hussars are distinct because they wear this jacket, you know, a jacket off, off the side. Um, but I'm guessing French, I could be along Prussian, and then another old guard, corporal. Among them, Sergeant Tanya of the Imperial Guard. Moray of the 2nd Regiment of Hussars, and Verlin of the 2nd Guard Lancers. These faces are a tantalizing link to the dramatic events that shaped the course of history two centuries ago. That was an excellent video. Um, again, this video was actually made around seven years ago from the time we're watching it. So yeah, again, the production quality of Epic History TV, you know, went up and we watched all of them. Um, so hopefully you guys like this video again on screen right now. I'll put up my um, the playlist for all of the stuff that we have done for this entire series. And finally, if it is available and if everything went right, Waterloo 1970, my entire reaction on YouTube. If everything went well, it should be up there, too. So hopefully you guys like that video. Um, and the rest, if not, uh, well, have a rest, have the nice day with the rest of your day. Wow, I can speak English. All right, so see you people later.